Uh, hi everyone, it's uh, Grant Abbott speaking. Um, today we're going to look at um, a couple of, uh, I suppose, typical of me, there's a couple of these documents that I've been procrastinating on for a long time. Uh, particularly for me, I, I originally set up uh, two SMSFs uh, when I was with my ex-wife and Rita Abbott. Some of you probably saw that she sold uh, now Infinity for $25 million to class, which was you know, good honour for um, uh, doing that. And uh, from that perspective, um, I had one for uh, her and her kids and one for myself and my kids, which is pretty typical for a blended family. And if we're looking at building moats down the track, uh, particularly for those of you who do make it to the 23rd and 24th, uh, of March, my accreditation uh, course or my succession and estate planning advisor accreditation course up at uh, the Sunshine Coast. We'll be going around a lot of that. But um, since obviously the divorce um, and uh, I've been living off, uh, now that I'm age 60, I've been living off one of the SMSFs and basically bled it dry. And so as is typical with all of us, as we tend to leave our finances to the last minute. And uh, so this wind up process uh, came through. So I built the SMSF wind up. I um, also had a request from uh, some clients, Belmores, who are one of our uh, Lightyear Docs licensees um, to do a trust vesting. And they sent me through quite interestingly. And this is one of the first times I've ever seen it. And I've looked at a lot of trustees, even old ones. Uh, the, they sent me through a family trust. Um, and with that one, uh, essentially, it was I think it was a hall and hall uh, trust deed and then effectively from that process uh, what we had is a position that uh, there was no vesting in there there was no ability to wind up or vest uh, that trust which was a, a wee bit scary so the process there is that if you don't have a vesting and they did have a vesting which was obviously at the end of the 80 years which is required under the rule against perpetuities um, at that stage what we had to do is effectively um, upgrade the deed um, or vary the discretionary trustee to a light year docs deed and then use the process within that trust uh, in order to vest. Uh, so it's quite interesting about that and we've gone through the process before of uh, upgrading trust deeds and really having a look at some of the old ones that pop through. Um, it's not a bad idea to start refreshing uh, a lot of our clients' discretionary trusts. Remember we had a look at uh, the Commissioner's guideline on that in 2012 or his TD 2012 slash 21. Um, so it's a good idea to go out and refresh and um, our existing discretionary trust for our clients. Um, and at the same time, uh, start to wind up and get rid of those uh, smelly ones that might be sitting there uh, um, in our clients, uh, and in fact, even in our own process. So, you know, from my perspective, at some point in time in the life of discretionary trust or an SMSF, the trustee needs to take a hard look at whether to keep the, the trust or SMSF going. There are countless reasons from insufficient funds to keep it going, uh, the death of the appointor or major member or say leading member, or simply the trust or SMSF has some transactions that the trustee does not want to shed any light on, like a Phoenix company, just bin it and get rid of it. And the process of wind up heavily relies on the accounts in the SMSF and for the trust as well as a criteria and process embedded within the trustee. Now, if we can get the accounts right and the process right, it can be pretty quick uh, to complete and I was actually quite surprised when I had a look at uh, the existing deed and the process and it can be really done fairly quickly and easily um, and not too expensive. The main one is it really throws it back onto the process within the deed um, and also more importantly the accounts. Now if there is no process in the deed it just simply allows the trustee or the appointor to wind up the trust or likewise the trustee um, in an SMSF uh, then we can embed the process um, in there, which I've basically done in the, the, the documents. So the first one is that the process of vesting a trust. Um, again, it will depend on uh, what the, the trust actually requires. But uh, generally, I've taken this from um, the Lightyear Docs Trust, and you'll see when we get to the SMSF shortly from the Lightyear Docs um, SMSF. But we're generally going to need to prepare any financial statements. Let me get my little uh, pointer out here so you guys can have a look at. Uh, and if we have a look at prepare any financial statements, that's quite often the uh, bleeding edge or the thing that may take time. Because up to the point in time, we need to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, we're going to best the trust at, say, 30 June of this year. 
So what we need to do is actually prepare the financial um, statements, uh, do the income tax returns, um, and any other accounts as required under the trust law and, and generally the regulator, uh, regulators. Um, we need to notify them and then we actually go through the process. We tried to do it before, if, you, if you're looking through your client list at the moment, particularly if you've got trusts that might have a few, not shady, but you know, transactions that you wanna just put to bed. Um, obviously, if you uh, wind it up uh, and then start a new trust, it's a-okay. You may have to take into account, um, obviously, any CGT or stamp duty issues there. So they can obviously have an impact when it comes around to, to taxes, um, as opposed to obviously um, just setting up a, or upgrading the deed. But if you want to put it to bed, then there's obviously going to be taxes and potential stamp duty if we end up keeping those assets. Um, some laws, um, depending on the various um, state acts under stamp duties, if you're paying out capital amounts to beneficiaries, there will be no stamp duties if you want to do it in specie. And again, provided your deed allows. So basically you've got to pay out and obviously get rid of all debts and liabilities. That would also include, which is pretty important to make sure that you render your invoice. Um, and I would generally do it up front, render the invoice uh, to the trustee of the fund slash, uh, in this interest uh, instance, the discretionary trust. Uh, render that to them such that uh, they receive that and it can be paid out of the, the monies out of the trust before it goes out. The last thing that you want um, is to wind it up or vest the trust, which is exactly the same terms, find out that we've got these outstanding liabilities, including taxes, um, also your position, and then find out from there uh, that there's not enough monies inside of the uh, fund. Uh, Ken's raised an issue. If assets are being sold, would you vest or just pay out um, all the income? If you're selling the, um, if all the assets are, are going to be um, sold, um, then, and you're not going to keep the trust, um, it's a good point. It's nice to keep the trust uh, for future transactions, but, you know, it's, I, I, would, I would have a look at the client. If there's no assets or no monies left in the fund, I would actually vest it and just get rid of it. Uh, because one is you're going to be up for the expenses all the time of uh, maintaining that and keeping a, a zero balance trust, which is not a bad thing if you're hoping there's going to be future transactions. But I'd probably get rid of it and then um, start again if the client's going to do, say, another development can or buy some properties, go in the next time, do it properly and use a leading member um, a discretionary trust for that transaction. So again, we, we need to do it on a play-by-play -play situation, but you know, from my perspective, it's not a bad idea just to get rid of these things and start again. So we've got to distribute or otherwise deal with the income of the trust, um, and particularly it's going to be um, the income up until the point in time that's vesting. And then what we do is we then determine the capital and pay it out to the capital beneficiaries. Um, all of you, all deeds, you'll find that there'll be different income and capital beneficiaries. Much the same as Bamford, we can stream them completely differently. Depending again on the deed, um, the income and capital beneficiary may be the same. So you can have your primary beneficiary, you'll have your secondary beneficiaries, you can have your, uh, for example, your bucket companies or associated entities. Uh, but essentially what we want to do there is we want to be in a position of uh, making sure that we determine the capital and the income. So again, that goes through um, your position. Um, we've got there uh, from someone who's uh, talking about capital losses. If you've got capital losses uh, in the trust or income losses, then it's probably worthwhile keeping it open because you can always distribute um, from, you may set up another um, uh, trust. Uh, so just keep that for losses, probably not do business in it but set up another trust that may have um, uh, business operations or investments. And then under Bamford, um, you can then distribute the capital gains into that other trust that's got capital losses to eat those up. Um, and then obviously that will then clean up the dis um, distribution, aggregate it basically sitting in there, um, and then obviously do a capital distribution once all those losses are then taken into account. So again, capital and income beneficiaries uh, generally can be the same. That's the, the whole benefit of being a, um, of being a uh, discretionary trust. Um, you'll see when we go on, um, now when we go through this process, to the extent to which the capital of trust shall not have been so distributed or dealt with, 
the trustee shall stand possessed of so much of the remains of the trust fund for the following default beneficiaries as shall then be living if more than one and equal shares as tenants in common. So what we're doing here is, you'll see when we come through, this is actually taken out of a process uh, from our light year docs um, discretionary trust and also leading member. So here, uh, one of the processes we'll go through, you'll see um, it's to stand possessed for the principal. Now that may be the leading member, it may be the appointor. Uh, you'll see when we go in, I'll show you the differences. It could be, for example, the, the, the primary beneficiary, then their spouse. Um, so what we're doing is as we're winding this thing up, we're looking who's the person to actually be the, the, the primary beneficiary, who's going to get the capital. The income obviously will then be just determined according to the primary beneficiary or your income clauses, but who's going to end up getting the, the guts of uh, the, the monies or the capital. Now, what I've done in this instance, I'll put it back to the appointor, the principal, the leading member, and if there's none of those, then it goes to the uh, primary beneficiary. So it goes to the principal and their spouse. Um, if the principal and their spouse are, um, are dying before the termination date, but they leave lineage. Now, the, the difference about lineage and bloodline is, for example, if I have a look at myself, um, then my brothers are my bloodline. My parents are my bloodline. Uh, my brother's children are my bloodline. But my lineage um, is only includes, for example, my two daughters, Sophia and Tiana. Will not include their spouses. So that's the difference between lineage and bloodline. And we need to get that across to our clients is, do they want it to spread it wide or would they uh, prefer to keep it in lineage? Um, so if we have a look at that, um, such issues, again, what that's doing is just saying, well, if, it's, if, if no one's alive um, and uh, I'm dead, then they would actually take my position as father um, or alternatively mother. Now, because uh, they, um, uh, uh, their mother wouldn't be included, they just take the, the whole 100%. Now, in the event of the whole or any part of the trust fund failing to vest in any one or more beneficiaries, the trustee shall hold the same upon trust for any charity nominated by the principal. Um, now, you may well find inside the deed that there's a charity already nominated. Um, I think I've got in my deed the RSPCA of, of Queensland. But failing that, then the, the principal um, or the trustee who remains there um, essentially uh, will take that spot. And again, remember, this is an important part of the succession process in a uh, trust. Uh, generally, you've heard me talk about this before. Um, I, if we've done the wrong thing and, and we're sort of stuck that the appointor or the principal or the leading member has died and we haven't got any succession, then we have to fall upon this. Ideally, we'd like to see the next leading member, the next appointor, would actually stand in the shoes and be possessed of all the capital um, sitting inside the um, the company or the shareholding in the company. Remember how we went through that that process, the leading member, that uh, on the death of the leading member, excuse me, um, their shares were cancelled and the new ones are issued. Because if we do that, then we can actually go through this process of vesting the trust. If we don't, then um, again, it's nice to have all this vesting, uh, but if there is no trustee, it's the last man standing, then we've got a huge problem because who's actually going to end up as the trustee? We don't want to have to go to the Supreme Court and get someone appointed as trustee, which will probably be the bloody public trustee, and that's going to cost an arm and a leg. Don't expect any money left in the trust after that. Or alternatively, if it's a corporate trustee, the shares being left um, inside the estate where it can be challenged under the Family Provisions Act, and you're going to find perhaps the executor can come in and, and wind that up. But like anything, um, if if that gets if the trusteeship gets hung up, then in that instance we're going to have a pretty long duration. It's better to have that succession in. And most of you, if you've been reading my writings, um, and certainly if you come to that two day session, I think there's only five tickets left. Um, we're going to make sure that all of our trusts. Um, have that appointorship um, set down in place. And I think from um, that one, we've got to make sure that um, we've got to make sure that uh, we probably vest the trust isn't a bad idea while people are alive and set up a leading member appointor. 
Let's just move on and have a look at uh, probably much the same. The SMSF is pretty easy. Go and have a look. Again, do your financial statements, income tax returns. Uh, because the rule against perpetuities doesn't apply to SMSFs um, or alternatively trusts inside uh, South Australia, really, we want to keep that longevity going. So we wind up an SMSF when it's no longer needed. Quite often that is be when, you know, like... If I have a look at my parents' SMSF, mum and dad, um, we moved them out of the SMSF as members when they got down to a balance of $300,000 or thereabouts. Now, the reason we did that was my brothers were still inside the fund. So the fund was quite healthy, but it now translated to the next generation. So we passed the SMSF on. And plus it was also getting bloody difficult dealing with the um, Centrelink um, having to go through all the hoops and uh, hoopla around SMSFs. It's much easier to take the money out, put it into a term deposit or whatever investments and have it outside because Centrelink, you don't have to go into a special section of Centrelink in order to get assessed. So look, I'm not sure what your, uh, uh, your experiences are, but effectively we've done that. But um, if it was only mum and dad inside the fund, then we would have had to wind up the fund. As I said, I've set up um, uh, funds where we have blended families. And once there's a divorce or something happens, then we can wind up um, that SMSF. And, you know, you're going to have some transactions. You know, you might be worried about if an auditor has done a contravention report uh, for some reason inside that fund. And particularly if you've got a pension um, assets inside the fund, it's not a bad idea just simply to wind up that fund and go and set up a another fund because then that, you know, if there's an attack on that fund, there's nothing left inside that fund. So again, I, I would, I, I, I think it's not a bad idea to regularly wind up SMSFs and start uh, new ones. Again, go through the same process, discharge, make sure you've got your expenses, debt liabilities and taxes all paid. Um, don't go through the Phoenix route. Don't leave it with a huge tax liability. Um, but anyway, that's I'll leave that with you. Make sure your audit fees, admin fees, everything is and surcharges are paid. Then you work out your final payment for, for members' benefits. Um, if it, the final member is in there and there's a binding death benefit nomination or an SMSF will, then effectively what we do is we follow that process, finalise tax returns, then you have to notify the, the regulator um, that obviously there's no trustee. Again, we've got to make sure we've got that corporate trustee, um, we've got the executor automatically um, being appointed in there. Um, it's easier said than done, but you guys are, are smart. Again, the succession, I can't, um, I can't tell you enough how important it is to get that um, succession um, process in. If I've got a bit of time um, at the end of this session, I'm going to take you through and show you the protector, uh, which is a process where we can uh, rip equity out of uh, existing homes, investments, et cetera, uh, and put it into a capital protection trust uh, without uh, CGT or stamp duty consequences. So um, that's essentially the, look, my whole goal is actually what I call reverse estate planning. Most lawyers actually take, in fact, I only dealt with a case this, um, this week where a, uh, a client had come through to us um, uh, through an advisor and uh, the first thing that they had in their superannuation was all the money's going into the estate, which um, they were very concerned about because um, of one of the daughters was in a relationship they weren't really um, happy about and they wanted to try and exclude the daughter. Now, there's no way in the world if money's going to the estate, you can exclude the daughter. Uh, for example, up in uh, Queensland, the Succession Act uh, will go through that process. Um, in fact, if you have a look at New South Wales, a succession act there even goes through and includes ex-spouses. So someone like myself, um, <laughs> you're going to laugh this, you know I've had a few marriages before. Can you imagine, Amrita, making a claim on my estate against uh, my daughters, which she has got full entitlement to? So, you know, from that perspective, I need, if I pass away, to have absolutely no assets in my own name. I need to have them in a trust, in an SMSF, and in the SMSF, I need to have a will that then goes down to an SMSF death benefits trust. So there should be nothing, even... Even my assets outside, even if I've got a car or I've got equity in anything, needs to then be put into a capital protected trust or a leading member trust, which is our process um, there. So let's move on and we'll have a look at, um, you know, Tim, thanks for that one. Yeah, can you imagine Amrita making, a, she's just got a like big payout, she probably still would uh, end up making a, a claim. But anyway, 
I think you're going to absolutely love the, the capital protection. So let me jump out of here um, and I'll come back here uh, a little bit later. So what I want to do is uh, we'll just go into the uh, site. Um, so I'm in Lightyear Docs now. Um, so this is the discretionary trust vesting. You've got a lot about the product, general information there. Um, again, this is uh, $99 um, as with all our, our documents. Uh, for those of you who are on licensing, obviously you, you'd be like me, you just got the LY strategist, so you can effectively be in the process of just starting the document uh, whenever you see fit. Um, so when we have a look at that, um, we just start the document. Um, it's pretty uh, simple. Uh, so what we do is we go again, remember, um, I'll put this into grants test. When I do that, just a couple of heads up, I'm gonna give you tips on the way through. If I try to start that, it's not gonna work. So what I need to do is put it in the folder. If you've got a pre-existing, I could set up a new one. Um, but if I've got my grant test, see when it goes green, green means go, now I can start the document. Uh, so a couple of people have been caught up with there. So this now goes into our system. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what, with um, now Infinity being sold for 25 mil, uh, certainly shows the value of our document um, system. So here we're gonna do, uh, let's say the Smith listing. Um, so what happens there is um, when you go into this folder, you're actually gonna see where it is. Um, for those of you who are licensed or you're using our, um, or you've got unlimited subscription, you're gonna have your logo. So you can put your logo in there. But there's always a default to use Abbott Morley if you want to have that uh, legal process. Mind you, all of our uh, deeds, just a couple of things on that. All of our documents are signed off by Abbott Morley. If you need to get a copy of the letter from Tony Anamoulis in terms of how uh, the process uh, shows that you're not giving legal advice, uh, just feel free to contact, contact us at support at uh, lightyourdocs.com.au and we'll send you that letter. Um, from that process, um, you would have seen, and it was going to be interesting to play out around now Infinity, but View Legal obviously got wind that they were being sold to class uh, and pulled their legal sign-off. So at the moment, there is no legal sign-off for any of the now Infinity documents, which um, I'm not sure whether it actually goes um, uh, retrospectively. So obviously there's a, a pretty big concern there. Uh, with class themselves, they've just been in touch with us yesterday and the day before. Um, assuring us that they still want to want to partner us with the platform. So it seems to me as though classes is going to not really uh, push that documentation that hard. It's probably going to be like BGL, which I understand is a, a stake in Smart Super their documentation. But anyway, um, you know our platform is really strong. You know, if I showed you behind the scenes how many documents are being done a day, it's, it's staggering, but we've got capacity to do a million documents an hour. So that's one of the reasons we can offer it uh, $99, pass it on to you. So we go the Smith Family Trust or whatever we've got. Um, we are integrating with um, CAS360. Uh, uh, um, we're just waiting on our developers to finalize a couple of things and we're off running. So we need to put in the date that the fund was uh, originally established. Uh, we go to the company. So again, we've got um, Smith nominees. Put in the ACN, which will make it a lot easier when it's CAS 360, because you'll just be able to pull all this data in. Five Smith Street, Sydney. My topping's not too bad today. I'm actually doing it quickly. <laughs> Um, two directors, so I just put that two in there and confirm, uh, and then I go down and put their names in there. So we've got the typical old John Smith. I tab there, I go there, then I go to Sally Smith, um, and then I just click who's gonna sign. So I'm gonna get them both to sign the document. Um, now, who attended the meeting? We've got both of them. Um, if I know the client's coming in tomorrow, then I'll put them in the 31st. Can you believe it's the end of January already? Now I've already put the data in uh, the field as to their address, so I, I just simply select and you can see that pre-populate, so I'll move pretty quickly. Now I'm gonna have to go into the um, deed itself um, to see um, who can actually uh, sign off 
uh, where the, the vesting is. So you need to go in and have a look in the deed. Um, let's say it's just clause 3.12. Now in there, um, generally I'm finding that it may well be the appointor or someone else who needs to sign off. Now I could, you have to tick one of those. You can't just leave it blank. So if, if it's just the trustee who can wind it up, then I just go through that process. Now, this is important because what I've done is I've tagged uh, generally the um, a point or a principal as the capital beneficiary. So if I go yes here, then I have to put it there. So who are they going to be? So I'm going to do a leading member. So I've got John Smith. In fact, I think I could have actually just gone select there because I've got John in there. So I pops his details. Um, I'll just put in John I've got. So, John. Okay, so they need to sign off as well, and that's the document. So it's now being punched out. Again, remember, at any point in time, um, I could obviously go back in and uh, relaunch that if there's if there's a change. So if I go and find that it's not the leading member, it's actually a point tour, I can go and change that. I can download it there. And again, um, this document's up and running. So for those of you who've got unlimited, just go and uh, get this out. It's not a bad idea, I would have thought anyway, uh, for you to get uh, one of your staff members to print out all of these and put them in a folder so you can go and have a look at them any point in time. So, um, sorry about the trees, but anyway. So we've got the Minister meeting the Smith Family Trust to be held tomorrow, Fire Smith Street, John and Sally, John's the chairman. Chair notified there was a quorum. So just check your quorum attendees. Um, so it was established by the deed 2018, 312. And then we've got there the leading member of point or consent. Um, and then we go through, remember this is the same process that um, I took you through um, in the, um, uh, in the uh, presentation. So we've got the leading member of point or just to show you the difference there. If I then go back to like your docs, I'm gonna go back into my vault. Can you see that? Um, so I'm going to go grant test. Um, you'll see there, here's the uh, vesting there. Um, so I just click on the plus or I could have clicked on it. I'm going to relaunch just to show you the difference. Um, I'm just going to change it uh, pretty quickly. Just show you how quick this is. It's just quite an amazing system. I'm going to go um, no, that there is no other consent. Go through the signing um, and then I'm going to get a brand new document there. So I've gone and checked my uh, document and I thought, oh gosh, I thought it was a leading member of Pointor or the appointor, um, but I found that it's actually just the trustee. So I go in and I pull that out. Now I've got a brand new set of minutes. Um, that's how quickly things can be changed. Now you can see there, um, it's not the leading member who is the capital beneficiary. It is now the primary beneficiary there. Now it's important if you have, a, have an issue around this, um, if you want, you can always, if you've got a really old deed and you're not sure, for example, the one that came to us a couple of weeks ago where there was no vesting inside the trust deed, then you can send it to us and we can uh, look at it at Abbott Morley. We can go through the process. It'll probably be about maybe five, six hundred dollars um, depending on the quote. And what we'll do is we'll do an upgrade or variation. And also then what we'll do is a um, set of minutes here for the vesting. Uh, alternatively, you can actually just jump on yourself. So remember how we did the variation of the uh, trust deed we did uh, before. So if I go into the product categories um, and I'll go down to the uh, trust. So if I have a look here, um, I can, again, my eyes aren't the best. So there's your deed of succession of the appointors. Um, so I can do a variation, where is it? So standard discretionary trust deed, investment trust, fixed unit trust. Oh, there we go, leading member discretionary trust variation. So you can actually vary it up to a, a leading member, do that. So that goes from your only trust deed up to the leading member one, which isn't a bad thing. And then that will take it into the minutes. So it means that what you're doing there is a twofold uh, process. You're actually not only varying and putting the leading member in, but what will happen is when you come around and uh, do this one here, is it here? No, the, um, sorry, when I look at this one, 
so it's a primary beneficiary, the first one, you'll actually, by upgrading it, it also means by upgrading to the leading member, you're also going to end up vesting and having a capital beneficiary, the leading member. So that's the process that I would do there, if that makes sense. Um, the other one we want to do, we want to go down to now just the SMSF windup. So I'm looking at product categories again. I could do it through the search, uh, but it's just the SMSF established and maintained. So you'll find there is the wind up. This was only just put on about 10 minutes ago. So it's up there, $99, start the document. Um, again, remember it's grant test, go back a little bit until, I, until it pops up as green, which there it is. So I'll start that. And then I go through exactly the same process as we did before. Um, so this is the, um, the Smith family S, or we'll just put this Smith S, S M S F wind up. Um, again, A M double O one. So that's the Abbott Morley one, which you saw. So um, we put the Smith family super fund. Now, what I need to do is um, this is a little bit different from the the trust, rather than all we really need for the trust vesting is just the original establishment. But when I'm looking at the uh, SMSF, I need to have um, all the variations in there. So it hasn't been varied. So the original was 2012. I go back and have a look at the last variation and I find that you know, it was varied on the 2nd of the 2nd, 2019. So it's last year. Um, now we go through again the company. Um, we've got the Smith nominees. I'll oh, just get rid of that zero or that O. Put the normal one there. Um, put in my ACN one, two, three, three. Oh, in the address again, your registered office. It'll be so much easier once we get the um, uh, linking in with. Well, actually, now it'll be linked in. I'm presuming now. Um, that uh, corporate messenger is over in Now Infinity. Um, they wouldn't let it, obviously, Now Infinity wouldn't let us a link in with their system for corporate messenger. Now I'm assuming that we'll be able to get a link in through class. So that will be one of our next integrations there. So that'll be pretty exciting. Um, so if I have a look here, I've got John Smith. And I've got Sally Smith. And again, it's the same process. They're going to get in. We're vesting both of them. Um, both of them are there. John, I select that. That will pre populate that. Um, I then go down to the clause. So I find there it's um, clause 6.2. Uh, do I need anyone's consent? Generally, you'll find inside an SMSF, it's very unusual. Um, so I'll just go no, and then we go through, and then that's popped up. So that's the wind up of the SMSF. So again, it's taken me, what, five minutes, and I'm hopeless at typing. Um, and again, one of the things, I know a lot of you like the integration, et cetera, with the others, but I find it's, if you've got the data, it's pretty easy to um, do it anyway. So I've got the download there. Up it'll pop with the Abbott Morley, you can see up the top, superannuation fund, wind up minutes for the Smith Family Super Fund. I'll just wind that up. Um, again, you've got the meeting, pretty simple. I've uh, got all the variations there, um, the deed, and then you've got all the process that's basically sitting in there. Um, just make sure that when you do go through, um, you can see this is executed by the trustee only. Um, if I go back and have a look here, remember this is the trust vesting, so we actually need um, I'm not sure why that's happening. I'll, I'll, it looks as though it's a mistake I made somewhere along the line. Uh, but if we have a look at um, the SMSF, we just need to simply get our trustees to um, execute and we're off and running. So that's basically the wind-up process. There's a lot more put on your plate because you need to go and just check your deed. But generally, if the deed is silent, then this minute actually sets up the process for that, if that makes sense. So what we're doing is we're imbuing a process in. You've just got to follow that process. 
you know, those um, in this one, the five steps, prepare your financial statements, so on and so forth, which really it's important and come upon you as uh, the accountants. So what I want to do now is I'll just go to this final slide, then I'm going to jump out and show you a couple of things anyway. Um, so um, next week, so next Thursday, um, I'm releasing, so that the session will actually be a good one. There's not a, what it is, is we're going to start releasing documents. I've got a huge backlist of documents to be uh, forwarded. Um, I've got a contract for uh, purchase or contribution of uh, property into an SMSF. Um, so that's coming up shortly. Business sales, we've, look, we've just got so much coming down the track. Um, but next week I'm going to release a client letter uh, for you to use uh, for SMSF wills, EPOAs, wills and testamentary trusts. So that's remember that's our moat. Um, I'll also break that down if you want into separately. So there'll be a client letter on the, the benefits and advantages of the SMSF will, where you can put your pricing in, your EPOA as well, and then a will and testamentary trust. Uh, what we'll do there is we've got an SMSF will fact find already, which is sitting up on the support centre. I'll have a look at that. We'll have an EPOA fact find, um, and then we've also got a will and testamentary trust fact find. So you'll now be armed to the teeth and going out and starting uh, looking at that with your clients. Um, with that process, actually I'll leave it till next week to do the process on that one. Um, I'll look at the protector now uh, very shortly, um, but we've got the succession estate planning advisor accreditation. If you want to go, there's only five tickets left, unfortunately. So the room, I wanted to keep it really tight and small room. So I think we've got Originally, I only wanted around 30 people, but we're up to 35. The maximum the room can hold is 40. So if you want to be part of that first group, it's going to be a really exciting couple of days. It's 595, so make sure you come along. And obviously, we've talked about class and, and also BGL, but they both want us to partner with them, which, which we are anyway. So I'm going to jump out of here. I just want to show you. So this is um, the, the back end of the system uh, that we use. So this is... Hot docs, you can see there, I've been testing the wind up. Um, I can go to all the work items um, that I do there. Um, you can see here we've got, you know, heaps and heaps. Uh, one of the ones and new ones that I've done, I think I've in fact got it here. Um, this is our new investment strategy. I'm not sure when I'll release this. Uh, one of the ones, there's been quite significant changes to it. Um, so what I've done here is always upgrading the process. Uh, I've got the trustee meeting, that's okay. So with the member, um, hopefully you can see that. Um, in the member, uh, I've put in a new one here. So member superannuation interest insurances and reserves. So what I've got here is um, if the fund maintains reserves, what will come out of, again, this is all going to be changed anyway, so this is a very draft. But if the fund maintains reserves, then it needs to have a prudentially managed strategy or prudentially managed strategy for those reserves and generally going to invest in either cash or equity. So by clicking that, that now incorporates a reserve strategy in your investment strategy. There's 52B, 2F and 2G. Uh, are supposed to work hand in hand, so I'll put them all in the, the same document. Uh, with the member, we've now got, we've made a couple of changes. If there's a pension, there's a, a separate clauses or separate copy that comes in for pension, uh, cash and liabilities. Um, and do they have existing insurance or, or will they have continuing insurance policies in there? Uh, we've also got um, now custom assets, um, where if you want to do a custom asset, um, you can do as you can see here, the custom asset, you can add as many custom assets as you want. So rather than going alternative, for example, I'm doing CFDs, I could put that in there if I want. I prefer you actually put it into the custom asset. But I, I will do that uh, possibly in a couple of weeks time. As I said, we've got a huge run on of stuff. Um, I've got advanced healthcare directives um, uh, coming up as well uh, for each state. Um, I'll probably release that later on towards towards May. We'll actually be doing living wills, uh, which is a huge, no one else in Australia is doing that. Um, certainly, it's not covered by any estate planning lawyers. So that's going to be, for those of you who are accredited, 
it's going to be a whole new uh, ball game for you um, where you set in place uh, um, not only moats and succession, but you set in place um, uh, that during life, your distributions, your money's coming out of your superannuation are to be spent or allocated in a certain way. So, for example, I'm about to put my mum into a nursing home, but she's chosen the same one dad's in. Um, now, obviously, there's not an issue there for me, but it's quite an expensive one, but they've got plenty of money. Now, if you've got a ne'er-do-well son um, and there's not that in writing, then obviously there's there's full discretion there for them. So we've just got to be very careful. So these are some of the documents that we've got. Um, most of these are sitting um, up on the site, uh, but I just want to take us, a lot of them aren't. So we've got, um, as I said, we've got heaps of stuff coming down the track, even employment agreements. Um, so there's the moat. Um, I've actually got a bigger one than the moat um, that you're using. This is the protector. So let's go and have a look at the protector. Uh, so I'll just I'll do it for myself, Grant. Okay. So I'll just take you through. So this is a this is a bit of a bonus for you guys, if you don't mind. You can drop off if that's all you wanted to see was a vesting. I'm actually taking you through this. So this is a, a preemptive for you. So we've got Grant, and then we have got Abbott Morley. So we go through now. You'll see when we get um, a long chain um, documents, which we'll see when we get. What we're doing now is to speed up the process, and you've seen this with the moat, we put in the common parties. Now, for this one, um, I'm going to put myself. So what this does is takes out um, equity that I own, so I'll just put, I might as well put my, so I might as well do it for myself. Queen Waters, um, Queensland, uh, that is four, five, six, four. Beautiful neck of the woods. So that's the first one. So now I want to add another. So I'm pulling um, monies out of, uh, I can put it out of a company. Um, essentially, um, what I want to do is put it into a place. So I could put it into a company. Um, I could probably put it into an SMSF, but um, let's go and put it into the Abbott leading member discretionary trust. I've already got that established and we'll put the company. Um, so we've got Abbott on our knees. I'm not sure what the sure what the um, uh, uh, not sure what that is but that's easy to, to fix up um, again twin waters uh, Queensland four five six four um, sole director um, so my full name is Riley Giles Abbott so go to the next. Now, uh, with that one, I'm not sure. Let, let's go through anyway. We've got we've got a myself, um, and then what I've got there is actually the solvency certificate. I'll go back to the common party. I'll go back to Abbott, um, and I'll add another one. So I've got um, add another, um, and then I've got uh, an individual. I'll just see. So. Michael, I think I'll do this, Jeff Fries, who's my accountant, I'm not sure his address, so I'll just leave that blank. Um, now, I'll go down to the documents, so I need a solvent, so would you like to establish a trust? Now, I've already got that, uh, but if I go yes, then I'll put in places of default the leading member. So, um, although I call it a leading member, Actually, it's not an SMSF establishment, it should be a trust. Um, so again, I've just got to go back and change that. So essentially, these are capital protection trusts. So what I'm doing is taking the equity out of everywhere um, and putting it into a trust. As I said, this will this will change. This is a very draft, but I don't need it. I've already got my trust there. So I need a solvency certificate uh, from my accountant, which I could have put in there as a common party. 
I need a deed of gift because what I'm doing is I'm looking at my assets. So for example, if I've got a principal place of residence, I'm taking the equity out of the principal place of residence. If I've got equity in any cars I own, uh, any shares, um, I can even do insurance policies. Uh, if I've got an endowment policy, um, cash at the bank, I can, I can take anything out of there. And what I'm gonna do is gift it over to that uh, leading member trust. Now, to do that, I'm not going to sell up everything, uh, which would obviously result in capital gain, um, or I'm not going to transfer it all over, uh, otherwise it'll be stamps and capital gains. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it by way of a promissory note. So um, then what will happen is it's now, once I do the deed of gift by way of a promissory note, and it's pretty simple, it goes into the trust. So now the trustee of the um, of the family or the discretionary trust um, now has that promissory note. So they're now going to lend that equity back to me, but there needs to be a mortgage deed attached to it. And if you want, you can do a personal guarantee. So that's there. Um, again, I know there's some pretty smart people uh, on this call. And I know, Ken, you're gonna love this one, particularly for all the, really everyone that you've done with yardening needs to have this in place. What it's doing is ensuring that on death there is nothing left. When, when I go around and do my will and testamentary trust, there's going to be nothing there. So it can't be challenged. Now, again, um, I've had a look at a lot of these and, and I've seen anywhere from this costing three and a half to $20,000. Um, if you have a look at some, lawyers will charge for this, but you guys will actually have this process. Um, and for those of you who are on our unlimited or licensees, you're going to have full use of this as well. And I'll get it up and running. Um, what I'll do is if you, if any of you got any thoughts that there needs to be extra stuff in there, and I know I've worked pretty closely with Tim Munro, and thank you very much for your time, Tim, on this. Uh, then we can go down the process. So the solvency certificate, um, select party. I've got Michael Jeffries there. Now, um, um, it's I love accounting. Um, now, I don't know what the address on that one, so I'll just put it 5 Jam Street. Um, I think it was at Broad Beach. But it doesn't matter. If we have a look at that, um, Queensland, that should be, I think it's 4022. I'm not sure. So I could have put that, ideally, I would have put that um, up here in this detail so that when I come round to doing the uh, solvency or this, all I need to do is I just had to put I love accounting in there. So I'll just again, I'll go five jam street, uh, broad beach. You see, because I didn't, um, when I jumped back, I lost that data. Um, so as you go through, it's always a smart idea to save as we go through um, on the process. So um, let me go through. I've got here from Kenrace, love it. Okay, cool. Um, how easy is it to increase values in subsequent years? Um, yeah, look, um, Ken, um, it's very easy to include it. I've included in the documentation. So it's just an auto increase. So the gifter is myself. Um, now, as you can see here, instead of completing this, because I've put as much as I can in the common party, this is like a CRM. So all I have to do is the gift is myself. Um, the giftee is my, um, should be a trust. Um, now I've done that, I've got it in there, and then that's effectively the process. So the gift, um, when I wanna do that, so let's say it's gonna be tomorrow, state where the deed is executed, I've got Queensland um, up there. Uh, the gifts are uh, cash, um, and then I'll put um, all cash. Sorry, all cash deposits at any bank or other um, cash management um, cash management institution. It's cool. Um, that's okay. Shares. So there I could actually put all my share portfolio in there. So let's just say I've got um, all shares in the light 
year group, although that is sitting in my trust, but it doesn't matter, I'll just put that in there. Uh, UPEs, so I can put all, it's not a bad idea uh, to put UPEs um, from my or any trust. Um, other, so I'll put um, all gold held in custodial. Again, I think you guys are going to get the uh, custodial trust. So I think you're going to you get a, an idea. So you can continually just put your whole format there. Um, I might put if you've got other there, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll put in another button there, add more, so you can continue to go through this uh, process there. Uh, so the promisor, the person who's actually promising is the individual. So that's obviously myself. Um, the promisee is going to be the recipient. So I've got the leading member. In fact, I have never thought about what would happen if we gifted it to an SMSF. I have to think about that one because you'd think it'd be a contribution, but I do have a gift clause inside the SMSF deed. Uh, details of execution. Um, again, it's going to be tomorrow. Um, it's going to be Queensland. Um, termination date. Um, so it's a promissory note. Is there a short term? Um, no, so it's not a SMSF. Termination date, um, look, don't worry about the three months. Um, effectively, what we could do is, um, probably not a bad idea, Ken, is uh, why don't we just roll it over to next year on the 29th um, so that each year um, you can, if you wanted to, you can go through this process with a client because you're going to have all the data there anyway. So how much is a promise of... Um, uh, to pay. Um, so let's say it's, you know, we've worked it out, the solvency, the accountant's done it. So it's not a bad idea to do it each and every year. So we've got um, $450,331. Uh, we'll promise always we promise say no, so there's no compensation. Um, oops, so it's just a number there. So sorry, we can see. So 450341. Uh, no, is there going to be a late payment charge? No. Um, the lender, so that is now going to be the trustee of the trust. So again, I'll go through that. Um, the borrower um, is obviously going to be the individual. So I can see there's a couple of chat um, and then the agreement details. Um, so again, um, what I can do there, date of the agreement, it's going to be the 31st, date of commencement of the loan, uh, the 31st, state where the loan agreement is going to be registered. We're going to go into Queensland. Uh, fixed or variable, fixed, uh, principal, what, what did I say? It's 450, 341, I think it was. Um, the term, uh, we can just make it like 20 years. Uh, what's the commencement interest rate? Well, um, again, whether we want to do market value, so I just do um, RBA um, prime rate, so that's fine. Uh, interest payable at the end of the loan term, um, and then uh, date of personal guarantee, if you wanted to do that. Just trying to give a market value. Right there. Is the guarantor the same as the borrower? Uh, yes. Date of the mortgage deed. Then, um, and then the charge property is real estate. Um, and then I can go down and put, no, actually I haven't done any real estate there, I don't think, I just did shares. So it can be um, all assets subject to the gift by the gifter. Okay, so that's it. Um, what I'll do now is we'll just have a quick look at the document. So there's still a few unanswered, but um, let me just have a look at that. So you can see how quickly that is. Uh, the main thing you're going to need is your solvency certificate, um, more importantly. So uh, also from Ken, would you need to list each individual property? How do you take into account any debt? Um, okay, so the debt comes out in the solvency statement, correct. Um, so what you're doing is just taking the equity. So when I download it, you've got a beast of a document here. Uh, So I can, if you guys want, I can actually pre-rush this and probably 
Um, we want various other members of the family to be capital beneficiaries. Okay, Peter, that's, yep, that's, that should be okay. Is that for, Peter, was that for the trust? Um, because you can make other members. What I'll do is I'll take that on board and I'll put in there other um, capital beneficiaries if you'd like to do that. Um, so leave that with me and I'll, I'll adjust that. So I've got the Word document here um, and that's the protector. So again, this is very rusty. Um, if you'd like, um, if any of you'd like, just email me uh, to grant at uh, I love SMSF, um, and I'll send you through a copy of this, a PDF copy, so you can have a look through um, and give me an idea on is there anything else I need to do before I do the final release. So here's the account account statement. You can see there I didn't have the firm details or the 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 the, the details in there, so that's where it sort of popped out from there. Uh, that's the deed of gift um, from the discretionary trust. Um, then we go into the promissory notes. You know, we then go into you know a whole lot of stuff: um, loan agreements, mortgage agreements, personal guarantees. Um, so it's quite extensive. I mean, I think if we go down, we've got forty-two pages of documents. So that's my nascent or my because uh, I'm getting towards the end of time. That's the um, that's the very first version of what I call the protector, which fits in perfectly with a moat. Uh, to keep things away from wills and testamentary trusts. Um, I'll look at releasing that not next week, but the week after. Um, but certainly it will play a prominent position uh, when we get round to um, our conference um, on the 23rd and 24th. If you haven't booked in, make sure you do, because they're going to be rare as hen's teeth. That the next one I'll be doing is probably in November. Anyway, it's the end. If uh, there's no more questions, um, thank you very much for your time. As you can see, the uh, vesting, I'll go back. Peter, really good question. I'll go back and um, I'll make sure that our beneficiaries, that we can open it up for um, the uh, family members or we can choose extra beneficiaries if we want, provided it's uh, under the deed. Um, and then what we'll do is I'll, I'll get that up and running by the end of today. So that's for both the, that's basically for the vesting of the trust. The SMSF should be A-OK. -okay. Uh, but that's the protector. If you'd like to get a copy of that, um, I'll just send you through exactly the one I just sent there. And uh, then you can have a look through it, um, have a really good going over of the, the document and then come back to me with any feedback uh, prior to release. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and um, look, I, uh, we've got a huge uh, range of stuff coming up and uh, look forward to working a lot with you and seeing you on the 23rd and 24th. It's Grant Abbott signing off.